hello and welcome. In this video we're going to be looking at Mark Baker's The 50th Gate. And in this uh, video we're going to be looking at his methods of representation and looking at analysing how he goes about uh, representing his uh, his story through the m number of text techniques he uses, through the language he uses, through the many different styles and mediums which he uses. And also just go for a little bit about the, uh, the characterization of his parents as well and why they're all important to the, the value and certainly the, the way that the text is presented and how these facts are all put together in basically a package which uh, really does help to connect the reader to the story of uh, what his parents go through and certainly towards his own life as well. So it uses a variety of methods and it uses a variety of methods to tell something historical which is something that avoids essentially what you would be used to a non-fiction text which is a simple retelling of history or maybe one that uses a little bit of description. And it, it shows you for a variety of different senses and emotions. So instead of just simply describing all the things that are there, it uses languages, it uses voice and it uses images. So certainly the connection between sensory and, and certainly oral language as in the language that is spoken, the things that are heard, even the way that they speak is all very important. So for instance, and I'll just use a very quick example to start with, if you're looking at the way that his parents' speech uh, is portrayed in the story, you would see that a lot of words are spelt according to their accent. So uh, his Yossel, he, uh, Baker's father, says nothing with a very thick accent and this is something he portrays, he makes a big deal of because of, it sort of highlights not only the way they speak but something that allows us to get their voices in their heads. So we imagine if we've heard something, someone speaking like that and we can sort of imagine their voice in ours and um, all those things. So we are able to basically really connect with them more on a level and we're, we're, we're imagining them as they are, not imagining things with other sort of qualities that we're throwing in. But we'll go through all of those in, in, in different um, stages of this video. So we'll go for Baker's method first. Now it is a departure from the normal style of nonfiction, and in that it's one which also basically is an account of their culture and their manner. So it's not just really about their parents, his parents surviving the Holocaust. It's about um, the culture and manner in which they do things, and certainly. The, the, their personalities come out quite a lot for the story. Now, why you would choose to show someone's personality when discru discussing the history is quite important because it sort of helps to show not only the qualities they use to survive, but the qualities which are affected through their survival. So, not only do we get this sort of, uh, uh, I guess, vicious cycle where um, they're it's their personality traits and particularly their strength as individuals and they're both portrayed as very strong individuals um, got them through the war but those same sorts of strengths those things that got them through the war are things which probably were influenced by the war as well so things which have affected them in life afterwards have been heavily affected by the, the things that they have seen and certainly um, their relationship with the community as experienced for example in 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 and discussion about neo-Nazi demonstrations, whether the family do get personally offended by it, is one of those things which you really start to see the connection of between not only the sorts of things that got them through surviving the war, but also the sorts of things that have affected them and the way that they they um, react in certain situations. And it's very um, fascinating to look at that as much as it is the personal history, and certainly the stories of things that we'd be quite unfamiliar with. Uh, by using Jewish, Jewish folk tales, stories, and language as well, it helps to give it that personal quality. Not only personal quality in terms of their family and the things that they, they would sing, and, and certainly the, the cultural um, ideas that we see through the different characters or through the different people, we see an emotional connection between those and, and the stories that we tell each other. And certainly the sorts of texts that are reappropriated for different things. So if you would look at um, Genia, for example, how um, Baker states that she uh, constantly um, compares herself to the heroines of, of famous plays. And it's one of those things that uh, she has this 
this almost this vanity about her, and that's brought about through her experiences that she always wants to to um, look her best, and she always wants to look y younger than her years because of the fact that she always feels she's af she's afraid of standing out. So these sorts of characterizations are quite important. Okay, one of the key ideas presented by this text is the interplay basically between history and memory. Now, what is this interplay to start with? Okay, well this interplay basically means that memory is trying to argue that memory is fallible, but it is essential. It helps to fill in the gaps which have been left by history. So if we're to talk about this balance between history and memory, history is essentially um, proven by research, by documents, by truth, by primary and secondary sources. Whereas memory is something which is, is unique to a person and certainly if you're like myself or many other people who forgot their keys this morning or, or something like that, it is prone to forgetting things and certainly it's, it's prone to failing. And yet memory is also quite important because of the fact that it tells things that uh, historical data would miss. So if you're to talk about an experience which has been reflected through a historical document, you can only really get the full picture by adding the memory to it as well. And certainly you actually get things from memory, which not only um, sort of sometimes contradict those historical documents, but certainly help to supplement them with a lot more energy and strength and vigor, which allows you to basically be able to picture them more so than if you were just to read the, doc the documents at face value. And certainly helps to give an understanding for those sorts of things that are being represented through, especially for German records, for a lot of numbers. And certainly German records in World War II were infamous for, for being not only very, very detailed, but for having um, a very sort of authoritative and, and certainly a very organized capacity, but not necessarily representing the sorts of things that they were doing with them. So that, this is where memory comes in and fills in those blanks. Baker in this text seeks to validate his parents' stories of life during the Holocaust. And so um, this is where the history and memory aspect really does come into things because of the fact that he wants to validate his, his parents' memories and he wants to do it while they're still alive. And certainly, uh, he says at the beginning, his, his motivation for writing the story was a heart attack from his father. And... Uh, from his ill health, he wanted to, while he was still alive, be able to confirm all the things that was basically told to him throughout his childhood. And seeing he had an opportunity being an historian, and certainly a very talented historian, he was able to um, piece things together and also do so in such a way where he is able to uh, really be able to validate love his father and his mother's stories and be able to um, find the documents and certainly find the records and, and testimonies which prove them to be true. He finds that not only are most of them correct, but there are bits of their memory which actually helps to fill in those gaps. And certainly without having them around to, to sort of tell stories about these, these things, he wouldn't have got the full picture of history and he certainly wouldn't have got as close to the truth as he has. Now, there may be some things which Obviously not the fault of the account or for um, either history or memory, but there are things that still do get lost and there are things which probably are still fallacies. However, by putting those two things together, you get a far more complete picture and certainly a, a definitely a, a far more accurate depiction of uh, what takes place than if you were to use one or the other. They are interdependent systems, which basically means they are relying upon each other in order to completely grasp history. All right, let's move on a little bit. We're going to go on to language. Now, language is really important to not only the, um, the Yiddish community and certainly the community, um, and it's certainly used a lot throughout the text, but what is the meaning of it? And certainly why is, is language so important in this representation? Well, not only does it sort of bring out their culture a lot, and certainly um, it, it does reflect them, it reflect, reflects their vernacular and certainly the way that they speak. Now, vernacular is essentially the way that a particular group speaks. It, it's not confined to language. It's confined to a community or a cultural group. So if you are to talk about Australian vernacular, for instance, certain phrases and, and certainly colloquial ways of speaking in Australian languages is very different than what you would find in other English-speaking countries. And it's the same story with this. So certain Yiddish expressions and certain ways of speaking 
in different communities, it was quite different. And certainly um, there were gaps in knowledge and there were things that someone would have to explain to someone else, even if they did speak the same language. So there is this, um, this basically this validation of their culture through their language. And certainly it's interesting to read their appropriations of English of a lot of things which they would say in, in Yiddish. And certainly they say a lot of things in Yiddish which, is, which are translated, which the meaning actually does change quite a lot. So language is quite good for being able to decipher history and certainly being able to decipher um, our values and belief systems because of the fact that there is such a gap between different languages and different cultures. By placing accents in these speech, it helps to basically comprehend the method of speech. And we certainly get a feel for what kinds of people they really are. And it's really, it's really, uh, it's really a nice feature to be able to do that because we, we not only imagine them a lot more clearly, but we get this um, appreciation for who they are. And it certainly helps to bring out a little bit of humor in the story as well. And certainly by, um, to, by raising some of the funny things that they say and certainly some of the funny uses of language that they use, we get a, more of a personal connection with them. We certainly do feel a lot more for them, especially when they make us laugh and they and make us feel for them quite a lot. So it's not just about telling uh, a story which is very sad. It's a story which is also about them and, and sort of one that allows us to think of our own families as well. And that's the sort of uh, connection that this sort of story really does quite well. Now, language techniques are also quite important to this. And I'm going to pick out here a couple of really main ones. Figurative language is used quite a lot. So language which talks about things not as they are, but sort of metaphorically. Now, figurative language is not something you would normally use in a historical text especially because of the fact that historical texts rely on details being factual and accurate. And figurative language is one where it's often interpretive. But the thing about figurative language in a sense is that it does allow some interpretation and certainly it allows interpretation of events such as those which are retold through historical fiction. Now by using figurative language, it allows a lot more of a, a a, an interpretive aspect to what happens. And by being able to interpret the sorts of things that occur in, in for instance, if you're telling, telling the story of um, the prisoner's arrival at Auschwitz, for instance, then we this figurative language is very effective for being able to essentially, um, for us to be able to relate the experience to something that we may have seen, for instance. And certainly use of onomatopoeia as well is one of those things where we sort of get the Im idea of um, sounds on top of the images, the, the feeling of cold, the, um, the various contrasts between things that we often see when, this, when these places are described. We see imagery as well, and very complex imagery, ones which, again, would uh, go beyond what you would see in, in the historical text, and that it helps to really bring things to life a lot more. We see use of contrast, and certainly uh, contrast is employed quite effectively to be able to uh, uh, really help us get an understanding of um, not only Baker's childhood, but how that contrasts with his parents' childhood. And colloquialisms, the way that they speak, and I'm sort of covered that in the last um, little bit, but the ways of speaking which uh, have sort of developed through their upbringing. Emotive and sensory language as well is really, really important and sort of ties into all these things. We're being able to connect um, people emotionally and using the senses. This is how you, you grab a reader. So if you're someone who's interested in writing and certainly for creative writing, one of the things you would focus on greatly is using emotive and sensory language because these are the things that people connect to. Now one of the weaknesses often of non-fiction texts is that they use very little of this. And so there's absolutely no way for us to be able to connect with them. So by using this, it's helping to really uh, establish a bridge between their family, who we don't know, they are strangers to us, and being able to make them feel a little bit closer to us and certainly give them a, a bit of warmth and a bit of feeling, which allows us to, to bond with them a little bit more than if we were just to talk about a random family. Because if I was to spend a half an hour telling you all the details about my family, you wouldn't care. However, if I told you a story about them, which is uh, 
more to do with, with something that you've been through yourself, it's obviously something that's going to draw you in a lot more. I'm not going to tell you a story about my family, by the way. Just I'm making the point. All right. So they reflect the nature of Yossel and, and Genya's journey. So that's the main point behind all these things is that they not only tell about their story in recollecting these moments, but it tells of their journey just through life in general and certainly captures uh, their not only their childhood, but their um, adult life and certainly their life in after having children. All right, let's move on. Imagery. Now, Baker's... Uh, method using historical fiction and sensory language enliven the story more more than most other non-fiction texts, which I mentioned before. So, by um, being plainly descriptive, it uses language like a fiction text. So, by doing those those two things, by basically using um, description and then using it like a fiction text would, it's helping to basically uh, mould the story into something we're probably a lot more familiar with. It's acknowledging that not many people do actually read nonfiction, and the reason why not many people re don't read nonfiction is because of the fact that it is boring. So by uh, incorporating some fiction elements into it, it certainly helps to tell a story which is much more along the lines of other, uh, certainly um, other stories or inspired um, pieces of historical fiction, which will probably be used to seeing more and more. So if you compare this to a film like The Shawshank Redemption, for instance, which again is a fictional one, inspired by actual events, there's a more of a connection there because it's not just giving facts and, and, and um, repeating ideas. It's really presenting this, uh, this cast and certainly this um, mood and, and atmosphere which certainly helps to drive people towards watching it. All right. It allows an impact on the reader and certainly like I was mentioning with that Shawshank Redemption uh, analogy, it allows you co to connect. It creates an empathetic reaction. So we start to feel for them. And even if you don't care about them in the beginning and you think, oh my God, I'm given, being given this boring book, by the end, you start to have some sort of feeling for them. And you'd be pretty heartless if you don't. So by connecting with them and, and certainly their story, we're able to get through the story a lot more easily than if we were just to be told a whole bunch of facts about them. Because, as I said, let's face it, no one cares about anyone else's family unless there's something which interests us. And this is why this method of representation is so important and so real, so strong as well. All right, let's go to this idea of personal stories. And as I mentioned before, one of the main themes is family. And it is basically, it's about a period of Baker's family history that influences many of their values. So it's not a Holocaust story as such. It's more about how this, this element of history has influenced their values and certainly their, their ways of thinking, their beliefs, the way that they handle themselves, the way that they treat their children. So it's about basically, if you look at this image to my right here, you look at this analogy of someone's hands and the things that they've been through. And all, if those hands could talk, all the things that they could tell you about. It's pretty much the same thing that if you were to look up a little bit, um, the eyes would tell you the same thing. And certainly the stories they would tell would give you a lot more of a, a, an indication about who they are and, and what they've been through. So by that image in mind, it's one of those stories that does that. It gives you a whole heap of, of things that you can look at and things you can piece together based on all these ideas that are put there. It allows us to be little historians ourselves in, in piecing together all these things and seeing what's important about different folk tales and different songs and certainly the symbolic nature of them as well. Indeed, um, the links uh, to not only the Polish culture but the Yiddish language as well and the Yiddish culture we sort of start to see um, a, a, a definitely a bridge building, but also because of the fact that it really starts to represent the things that they, ha they are, the, the, even the things like um, the ways that they speak, the, the school grades that they got, um, the types of people they are, the, the sorts of things that they do for their children, all of those things, the way that they talk to each other, the way that they talk to their children, the way that um, even the way that uh, Baker talks about what happened when he got into trouble from them. All these things sort of start to tell you a little bit more about who they are and where they come from. And by, as I said, that personal Australian story as well, we get um, the sensation of 
also what he has has learnt from it and certainly why he's interested in that. Conflict comes through the, the, his role and the author has a really strong role and, and seeing as it is Baker himself as a character in the story, it's not just being told through the things that he's done, he's telling it as a sort of a biography. He, he takes two roles, he takes the role of a son and one as an investigator. So at times, and he, 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 and he does admit this even throughout the text, is that he, he finds himself a little bit too desperate to know more. And sometimes he doesn't give his parents the appropriate space they need, or certainly the amount of time. He's so desperate to learn more, and certainly so anxious to learn more, that he often pushes them a bit too far. And it's one that he writes about overcoming at different stages. So it, it shows a bit about them, metaphorically speaking even, that this resistance, which is represented through the text, is one which sort of in, in its own way shows the sorts of things that they've been through. We move on, look at historical fiction and what it is about it. Now historical fiction is basically anything which has been inspired by true events or is inspired by fact. And it uses this to basically create these sensory and emotional gaps. We can't get the idea of Auschwitz prison by going for it now. We can sort of see things and we can see the buildings, but in order to really uh, get a feel for what happened, the only way to do that is through fiction. And by seeing it through our own eyes. Even if you were to get a testimony from someone who survived, yes, you would get their story and certainly you would get a lot of of a feeling for what it was like. But it's only if we're able to see it for our own eyes as well that we really do get a true appreci appreciation for it. And that is exactly why historical fiction is used to such great effect in this text and why it is used as a method of representing what happened. Because by us being able to see it through first person narration, for our own eyes, we start to, to connect with it a bit. We can start to pe piece the little bits together. We can sort of feel the cold and, and, and really get appreciation for it just through the fact that we're reading it as a first person account. It makes it more emotionally confronting. And certainly this is one of the, the, the strong features of a good um, text is one that provides a little bit of confrontation and certainly makes you feel for it. It uses this method and, and of writing to create a lasting impact as well. Now, how it does this is by contrasting fiction to non-fiction recollections of the family. It basically helps to bridge that transition, and certainly not in the, the um, transition between what has happened and what's been lost, but also through um, the Holocaust and modern Australia, which we do get as a contrast as well. So all these things do blend in. All right, let's move on to characterization. Uh, the text offers very detailed characterizations, and it, as I mentioned before, it does this through vernacular, through language, and through various mannerisms. So I think I may have mentioned this example before, but I'll go for it again, which is that um, Jenny hates exposure, and her, uh, her immaculate self-presentation oh, is a very clear sign of that. So through basically um, making herself pretty at all, all times, and, and applying makeup and, and nail polish and all those things. She's essentially trying to not fit in, or oh, sorry, um, to not stand out. She's trying to fit into a crowd. And through doing that, she's basically um, reliving her childhood all over again, where she was uh, trying to live incognito in, in villages, in, in small farming towns, trying to escape the, uh, the gaze of, of Nazi soldiers. So certainly we see that, and certainly we connect with such things. We connect with those sorts of mannerisms. We can imagine what it is they've gone through. So this is not a historical fact. This is something which is just inherent to her and certainly the way that she does things. And so by stating that, what essentially Baker is doing is it's allowing us to connect with that character and then be able to justify those reasons through her actions. And this is something which is a little bit... Um, sort of interpretive and certainly one which you have to um, apply for your own knowledge, but it's some, one that's very effective. It influences basically the author as a person and how they are responsible for, for conflict and things like that as well. Very important there. All right, so the main question now, which 
you'll be asking is, okay, what does this all achieve? Now, we'll go for it. Because this having all these facts is good and having all these methods of representation are good, but you need to be able to discuss what effect they have and certainly what they help add to the text. So what I'm going to go through now is just a couple of key words which you can essentially um, state as being things which are in, or are created by Baker's research. Of course, there are others as well, and you're free to, of course, explore them and go through them. So one of the things that definitely adds is authenticity. Now, by authenticity, not only does memory help to, and certainly by um, describing things in, in great detail, um, help to create, I guess, a, an authentic sense of what it was like, but also through having historical research there, being an historian and using that background effectively, helps to create the sense that yes, it is true, and this isn't an exaggeration. Empathy is another key strategy as well. And certainly, if, it, if this text doesn't create empathy the way it does, then its method of representation has probably failed. The point of the story is to create empathy. It, it is to create um, a sense of what it was like to be there. Um, sensitivity is another key idea, which when we look at things, and we, we know now how to be sensitive of it for reading the story. We know uh, what sorts of sensitivities people have to things that have happened and the reasons for those things. And certainly the representation shows sensitive subjects and really helps to bring them home. Emotional impact as well is something that's quite similar. But it's one of those things that we feel. So sensitivity is one of those things that I guess we, we sort of feel through the text. Whereas emotional impact is something that affects us. And similarly, reader interest as well. It's one of those texts that, again, is, is designed to take something which most people probably have heard before. And, and certainly, um, while it is a very good story on its own, having those um, elements which are helping to build reader interest are quite important as well. Understanding is also one of those things. It helps us to understand what it's like, and by using those contrasts, certainly contrasts to the things that we feel now and we, we take for granted almost, we get a, an understanding of not only um, Baker's attitude to things, but we also see the um, connection to uh, his parents and certainly their way of, of thinking about things. And finally, personal. This is a very personal story, and by making that personal connection, we are, we're investing ourselves into the story. It's not a bunch of historical facts which we're distancing ourselves from because we weren't part of them. We're connecting with them because it's related to our families, and we sort of wonder what our families were doing at this time, what our grandparents and great-grandparents were doing. So by having all these things together, basically what we've got is we've got a really detailed um, method of being able to tell their stories, but also be able to tell it in ways which are able to capture imagination and capture the heart, which is probably the most important quality of this as a non-fiction text, and certainly where a lot of other non-fiction texts fall down. So that's basically it for the, the 50th gate. So it's one of those texts that you just gotta go through, and really the key scenes for you now are the ones which sort of reflect all these things. So it takes just a bit of a reading and even a rereading of the text. And because of the text being in very short chapters, this is quite easy to do, and be able to pick out some notable chapters and then being able to analyze them more in depth. And really, it depends on the sort of angle that you're wanting to, to talk about to what angles or what chapters you'd be choosing for your analyses or your analyses and responses. So that's about it for the 50th gate. Until next time, I'll see you later. Thank you.